In October of 2019, 33-year-old tech entrepreneur Aaron Valenti was found dead in the backseat of her rental car on a residential street in San Jose, California, just five days after she was reported missing. Her body showed no outward signs of physical trauma, toxicology reports showed no trace of prescription drugs or other substances, and an investigation by the San Jose police reported they had found no evidence of foul play. Erin's autopsy report, which took months to be completed, listed her death as being due to natural causes, and the medical examiner decided that Erin had suffered from sudden death in the setting of an acute manic episode. Erin Valenti was young, intelligent, outgoing, active, energetic, and in peak physical condition with no history of manic episodes or any other mental health issues. But law enforcement, who had reviewed her electronic communication as part of their investigation, claimed some of her behaviors showed symptoms of a manic episode. It would be reported that Erin had spoken to several people that day, including her parents and her husband, and during these conversations, Erin at times sounded confused, while at other times she sounded confident when telling her mother that, quote, it's all a game, it's a thought experiment, we're in the matrix. End quote. As it turns out, Aaron Valenti, who was a highly successful tech CEO who oversaw multiple businesses and hundreds of employees, had also been interested in something called bleeding edge technology, a technology that's a step past cutting edge, with a focus on drug free, implant free, mind controlling brainwave technology. With a very flimsy cause of death given by officials, people began to wonder how an active and healthy young woman could suddenly drop dead without any signs of injury. Because of the nature of her final communications and the unique interests she was exploring at the time of her death, the question has been asked if it's possible that Erin was no longer at the wheel of her own brain and behavior. But was that because of a sudden and fatal descent into a mental illness, as the police have suggested? Or was it because someone else was pulling the strings? Hello, everybody. Happy Halloween. I would like to formally and happily welcome you to the very first video of Halloween 2023. And I believe this is our fourth year doing Halloween. If you're new to the channel or if you're new to Halloween and you only just started following me after last year's Halloween, Halloween is the entire month of October where we focus on stories and cases that are a little bit more twisty and turny. Maybe they have a supernatural vibe. Maybe they have a an uber mysterious vibe. Maybe they're not something we would cover or talk about during the year, but it's October, so now we can. And I have to say it is my favorite time of the year. I know it's a lot of other people's out there favorite time of the year. I see a lot of comments in the last few months saying, yay, Halloween's coming. Are we doing Halloween this year? Of course, we're doing Halloween every year until I die. Okay, Halloween is going nowhere ever. So I'm really excited to kick off this month with you. And I'm also really excited to kick off this month with a case that has really taken me down the rabbit hole, not just recently when I covered it for Halloween, but for the past several years, actually since it happened in 2019. So we are going to talk about that today. We have a lot to get into today. A lot of interesting side quests are going to pop up during this case. But before we do, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. Many of you who've been with me for a while or even a short time know that I love Magellan TV because of the wealth of documentary films and series they offer. And I also know that many of you have joined me in making Magellan TV your go-to for real-life stories that are keeping us entertained and educated for hours. And this month, I have a great recommendation for those of you who are already watching Magellan TV or for those of you who want to give it a try by taking advantage of their one-month free trial. And my recommendation fits perfectly with this month's spooky theme. Fifth Dimension brings you six creepy episodes that ask the questions, can people move matter with the power of their mind? Can they read thoughts and see into the future? Does life end in death? 
all valid questions. The series follows substantial research with top caliber scholars, and it shines a light upon telepathy, telekinesis, ghost reincarnation, exorcism, and near-death experiences. And there's even an episode on the exorcism of Annalise Michelle, who we did a series on last Halloween. There's also a super interesting episode on reincarnation that I highly suggest, so go and check that out. All you have to do is click the link in the description box and start your one month free trial with Magellan TV right now so you can watch these six episodes for yourself, as well as all the other amazing content Magellan TV has to offer from true crime to history, science, travel, nature, mind, and body, and so much more. The best part is you'll never run out of new and interesting things to watch because Magellan TV adds 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week. And you can watch Magellan TV on multiple platforms from your cell phone, tablet, your computer, your smart TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. Don't forget to click on the link in the description box, sign up, and start watching. You can cancel anytime, but I doubt that you'll want to. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. From what I've learned about her, Erin Valenti was a force to be reckoned with, which is probably how she earned her nickname, Armageddon Aaron. She was known to exhibit boisterous, seemingly endless energy. She had a booming voice, and she was not one to bottle up her emotions. She was always speaking what she felt and thought with no apparent filter. Aaron was social and friendly, constantly surrounding herself with friends, loved ones, and people who inspired her. And she was incredibly driven, never wanting to stop striving until she achieved every single one of her dreams and ambitions, which is illustrated by a quote in her Instagram bio. Maybe one day I'll settle for second best. And on that day, hell will freeze over, the sun will burn out, and the stars will fall from the sky. Erin had earned her BS in business administration from Georgetown University, where she'd majored in finance and international business, graduating summa cum laude. At the age of 18, she met her husband, psychologist Harrison Weinstein, at a hotel in Quebec, where she and her family took skiing holidays. And her first job out of college was an associate position at Summit Ventures, a $15 billion venture capital and private equity group in Silicon Valley, where Erin would go on to to lead a communications team, as well as source and close investments in the cybersecurity, insurance, and financial tech industries, which is a lot for a very young person. She took on a lot of responsibility. She proved herself to be competent, and more than competent, she proved to be an asset, and she was given a lot of responsibility. She was given a lot of leeway to do what she saw fit. Erin remained at Summit for four years, but then something happened that had Erin leaving Summit and California in 2012. Her husband Harrison had completed his doctoral studies and had been offered a fellowship position at a veterans hospital in Utah. Now, Salt Lake City was not where someone like Aaron wanted to be. At that time, they didn't have much of a tech scene, but locals claimed that Aaron arrived like a whirlwind and basically willed a community of tech entrepreneurs into existence, immediately networking and finding out who these people were in the area so that she could gather them all in one place and they could work together to put Salt Lake City on the tech map, leading her to start something called SLC Startups. Salt Lake City startups. And basically, this was a little group, like a, a networking group, a BNI group, uh, where people in the same industry could come together, exchange ideas, exchange contacts, talk about things, and just share their passion and their work with each other and help build each other up. Ryan Kruzinga, a former coworker and close friend, told a Business Insider, quote, it's not that she came to like Salt Lake City, she made it into something she liked better, end quote. Erin began working as head of product development for Overstock.com, where she oversaw a team of 250 engineers. Not being one to settle for just going in to punch a clock, though, Erin also helped to form the internal corporate venture cap group at Overstock, which is now called Medici Ventures, and she spearheaded their first five investments in blockchain companies. So it kind of seemed like whatever company Erin found herself at, she advanced it. She bettered it. She pushed them to their limits. If they were doing things to the status quo, if they were just going through each day, not really advancing, not really progressing, she would come in and shake things up with her energy, with her drive, and with her very easy way that she had with people. During this time, because Erin wasn't really running her own business and she was working for a different company, which was Overstock, she kind of took a little 
break from just working all the time, and she started to enjoy herself a bit. She ended up discovering many opportunities that Salt Lake City has to offer as far as outdoor fun. On any given day, she could be found hiking, climbing, and floating down the Provo River in an inner tube. Erin also organized a monthly meeting for tech workers at a downtown sports bar, and before long, she was legitimately a staple in that community and in the city. Once again, Erin was not your average average 9 to 5 employee. She had big dreams of creating something that was all her own. And so in 2015, she founded Tinker Ventures along with a man named Amir Khan, who was also an entrepreneur living in Pakistan, and she'd worked with him on projects in the past. Tinker Ventures was a web development shop that designed, developed, and scaled tech products built for iOS, Android, and the web. And it employed 120 people. But it seemed that most of these people, if not all of them were in Pakistan, and for a long time, Erin was the only U.S.-based employee of the company. And according to her brother, Chris Valenti, this was very difficult for somebody like Erin, who was social, who got her energy from others, who got creative stimulation from others. So she would often get lonely working from home by herself. Tinker Ventures would slowly but surely evolve into a million-dollar company, and as Erin was known to do, she became restless. She started to focus on what came next, what her next achievement would be, what could she do next to better herself, her community, and the the people around her. So Erin started telling colleagues that she wanted to invest in billboards on Interstate 15 that would advertise a venture fund meant to invest in women-owned and operated companies. And Erin was also working on a clothing line for professional women. And I get this so much, this kind of personality, because I have a tendency to be this kind of personality. I always wish there was 10 more of me and 50 more hours in the day because I have so many ideas and I want to do so many things, but I just don't have the time or the energy or the mental bandwidth for everything that I want to do. So I always feel like I'm failing. Like I have all of these amazing ideas and I just don't have the resources to enact them. And I understand also that working home by yourself can be very alienating and you want to kind of strike out and see what else you can do that you can pull other people into where you can benefit from them and they can benefit from you. And Erin had a lot of ideas. I mean, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of ideas that she would just jot down, talk about all the time. Weeks before her death, Erin was talking with friends about investing in and supporting local artists and filmmakers wanting to dip her toe into the creative pool. And according to Aaron's husband, Harrison, he said, quote, she had a million half-cooked ideas and mini projects and prototypes floating, end quote. By the summer of 2019, Erin had contacted her friend and local entrepreneur, Scott Rafferty, telling him that she wanted to look into getting an executive coach, which I did not know what that was, but according to Google, an executive coach is a trained professional that works with leaders and teams to identify and overcome obstacles to their success. I think I need an executive coach, so if you guys know anybody who's good, send them my way. Scott Rafferty, Erin's friend, already had an executive coach, because apparently this is just a common thing, and it It just so happened that this person was in the process of planning a retreat in Orange County, California for the following fall. Erin signed up for this retreat and scheduled her travel to California for October, hoping to be inspired. Now, this retreat was a three-day seminar designed for business owners called Create Powerful, and it would take place in the beach town of Laguna Nigel. I looked up this seminar, and I found out that it is, quote, the moment where success Successful men and women come to terms with the perceived limits of their success and the psychological boundaries that hold them back. End quote. Now, Create Powerful has been touted as a life changing experience that will cause a transformation in those who do attend it. And it has been described as a course for people connecting to their own personal power. According to their website, Create Powerful is not a feel good seminar, it's not designed to make attendees happier about who they are today. Create Powerful is a rigorous course that will provide you, as a committed participant, an opportunity to see, understand, and interact with the world in a new and powerful way. It's about moving beyond linear and circumstantial definitions of power to truly come to a new understanding of just how powerful you are as a human being 
and what this understanding will create for you as a possibility. It sounds intense. (laughs) Am I right? It sounds intense. And it also costs $6,000. So you better be coming home with the recipe to that limitless pill that Bradley Cooper was taking. You know what I mean? Like if I'm going there and paying $6,000, I better have like my complete 100% of my brain unlocked and ready to go. So I read through some of the participant testimonials and a couple of them struck me simply because of the whole matrix aspect of this case, right? So one person said, quote, this course changed my world. I now have access to being awake and recognizing when I am not, end quote. What was it that Morpheus said to Neo in the matrix? You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you wanna believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Another participant stated, quote, This course changed every life in the room, and they will change many more. I observed people change before my eyes. This is a must for anyone interested in a more powerful life. End quote. In late September of 2019, Erin Valenti flew to California and attended the three-day Create Powerful workshop. Her friend, Scott Rafferty, was also in attendance, and he recalled seeing Erin mingling with the other attendees on the lawn of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel during a sunset dinner. Rafferty said that Erin had told him the last three days had inspired her to hire a local team for Tinker Ventures, which would not only give her back time and energy to pursue other interests, but would allow her to have people there that she could socialize with, that she could bounce ideas off with, that would give her energy. And before parting ways, Erin and Scott hugged, and they promised to talk soon. Before leaving Utah, Erin had posted on Facebook on September 25th, announcing, quote, heading to San Francisco and LA soon, who's around, DM me, end quote. So on October 3rd, after finishing the conference, Aaron took a flight to the Bay Area for another conference for business founders and tech investors, this one being two days in Monterey. And during that weekend, she met with friends and former Silicon Valley colleagues for dinners, coffees, and brunches, because remember, Aaron used to live in California. She used to work in Silicon Valley, so she knew a lot of people. Most of the people she met with that weekend said that Erin talked excitedly about plans for new business ventures. During this weekend, Erin's credit card statements also showed that she purchased several vinyl records, even though she did not own a record player or turntable. And some people have used this to show that she was not in her right state of mind. I don't think that it's anything really to read too deep into. I don't think it suggests that Erin wasn't thinking straight as some of these articles reporting on her death claim because I don't own a record player, but I do own several Taylor Swift and Lana Del Rey vinyls that I want to hang on my wall as art because they are art in more ways than one. And I do have plans to eventually buy a record player once I have time to do the research and figure out which one is going to be the best but I don't have a record player now. However, I own several records. So to me, that in of itself is nothing. It really doesn't say anything. But at the end of the weekend on Sunday night, Erin had dinner in Palo Alto with her first boss from Summit. His name was J.J. Cardwell, and they talked about the Create Powerful workshop, and Cardwell stated, quote, she cared deeply about Tinker, and it mattered a lot to her identity. She was very committed to the continued path there, but she realized she could do both. She had elevated enough as an executive and an entrepreneur that she realized she didn't have to be one thing. Any normal human being can do one thing, end quote. So it does seem like the Create Powerful workshop was very impactful on Erin, and it really did, like, get her going. It kind of, like, struck a chord with her. It triggered something in her to, like, drive her forward, which is exactly what she wanted, and that's why she went there to begin with. Reportedly, Erin met with another previous Summit colleague on Monday, October 7th in the afternoon on Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto, and his name was Dean Jacobson. But he was not technically the last person to see her alive, or at least to hear from her before her untimely and tragic passing. He could have been the last person to see her alive. He was not the last person to talk to her before she sadly passed away. And because I'm not 100% convinced that there wasn't foul play involved in Aaron Valenti's death, I wouldn't necessarily say 100%. He was the last person to see her alive because if somebody did something to her, 
that person would be the last person to see her alive. But either way, Erin was due to fly back home that same day. Since she was scheduled to appear at a Utah ceremony the following night to receive a Women in Tech award. So Erin called her mother after leaving lunch with Jacobson around 3.30 p.m. And she said she was walking around and she was trying to find her rental car. A gray Nissan Murano. And she needed to find her rental car so that she could drive to the airport and catch her flight. She said that she believed she'd parked it right around the corner, but I guess she was wandering on the phone with her parents and basically saying, like, I thought I knew where I parked it, but I cannot find it. Now, around dinner time, Erin called her parents again. At that point, I guess they were out to dinner celebrating their anniversary. And she told them that she had found her rental car and she was driving to the San Jose airport, which would have been less than a 30-minute drive from her last known location on Sand Hill Road. While she drove, Erin remained on the phone, but something was off about her. And it kept getting significantly more and more off. Her mother said Erin sounded excited and confused. She was talking a mile a minute, zooming from topic to topic and not making a lot of sense. Erin mentioned something about plans for Thanksgiving. She told her parents that she'd gotten gas 10 minutes before getting on the phone with them, but now she claimed she was out of gas, and she announced that she was going to miss her flight. At that point, Erin's mother, Whitey Valenti, who was a nurse, called Erin's husband, Harrison, who was a doctor, and asked him to check in with his wife. And over the next few hours, until almost midnight, Erin's parents and husband took turns talking to her on the phone. During this time, Erin continued to get more and more agitated, and she continued to make less and less sense in what she was saying. At one point, she told her mother, quote, It's all a game. It's a thought experiment. We're in the matrix. Are you in on it? End quote. At one point, she announced that she was basically just driving aimlessly around because her GPS wasn't working. It is worth noting that the vehicle she was driving did not have an activated GPS system, but the police have not said if they were able to track Erin's path that night using her cell phone data. It has been reported through the Missing Pieces Network that Erin's last known cell phone ping was near the Almaden Expressway and Camden Avenue in San Jose around midnight, and this location was about 14 minutes away from the airport. Whitey, Aaron's mother, asked Aaron if she'd consumed drugs or alcohol or if she'd taken any food or drink given to her by someone she didn't know or trust, but Aaron said she had not. At that point, Harrison, Aaron's husband, called the police and asked them to call Aaron and do a welfare check on her. But when a police officer reached Aaron on her phone, she told him it was nothing. She'd only been joking. At some point around midnight, Aaron's phone was either turned off or the battery died, and all of her incoming calls started going directly to voicemail. That night, Aaron did not return her rental car. She did not board her flight back to Salt Lake City, and she was not present when her name was announced on October 8th for her Women in Tech Award. When Aaron's parents and husband tried to report her missing to the San Jose Police Department, they were basically told, as we've seen a million times in these cases, that Aaron was an adult and her case would be treated as a voluntary missing person. They said that Aaron could have just decided to disappear for a few days without telling anyone. But this was not a satisfactory response for the Valentes and for Harrison Weinstein because they had spoken to Aaron on the phone that night and they knew that something was wrong. She was not acting like herself. The police took the description of Aaron, her vehicle, and the California license plate, but not feeling hopeful that anything would be done by law enforcement, Harrison flew to San Jose the next day, followed later by Aaron's parents. Harrison Weinstein posted on Facebook, reaching out to the local community in the area where Aaron was last known to be, saying, quote, I write this post with a lot of pain and fear, but I can really use your help. My wife, Erin Valenti, has been missing since Monday night. She was last seen in Palo Alto Monday afternoon wearing torn jeans and a white t-shirt. If you have seen or heard from her, please let me know. She was last driving a gray Nissan Murano with California plates, ALUD641. Any information about her whereabouts is much appreciated and can be directed to me, her family, or the San Jose Police Department, end quote. And to their credit, the locals sprang into action. Keeping an eye out for Erin, a couple people even flew a drone over the area that her phone had last pinged at. And during the following days while she was missing, there was no activity on Erin's cell phone, credit, or debit cards. 
On Thursday, the San Jose police finally filed a missing persons report, and Harrison posted on Facebook, quote, I would like to emphasize how out of character this would be for Erin. While she is an adventurer, she's not foolhardy and would never intentionally be out of contact with her family. As a psychologist, I am especially concerned about her last calls, which were confusing and disjointed, end quote. Aaron's family and husband started the Help Aaron Valenti Facebook page, triggering more than 1,500 Bay Area residents to start going out on their own to locate the missing woman. And it was one of these volunteers, and not the police, who eventually located Aaron's rented gray Nissan Murano on Saturday, October 12th, after she'd been missing for five days. The car was found parked on Boys Lane, a residential street in South San Jose, less than a mile from her last known location. The car windows were rolled up and Aaron's body was found in the back seat. In the aftermath of this, Aaron's father, Stephen Valenti, came out and publicly announced that although he was grateful for the compassion shown by the San Jose police, he also felt they had not done enough to find his daughter. Valenti said, quote, It had been an issue from day one, Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It wasn't until the end of the day Thursday that a missing persons report was actually put out on the street. End quote. San Jose Police Chief Eddie Garcia told the Mercury News that detectives from the missing persons unit had been assigned to Aaron's case on October 9th, and they had sent out electronic bulletins to police agencies around the greater Bay Area, extending as far as Monterey. Garcia said, quote, We were on this case. We didn't ignore this case. We're going to look at everything we did and see if there are ways to improve. End quote. Which I'm sure is not helpful to the people who now have to mourn the loss of Erin Valenti and wonder why it took you several days to even consider her to be a missing person. A broken-hearted Harrison Weinstein updated the Facebook page, writing, quote, while we were praying for a different outcome, we are so appreciative for the help and support you have given. Please remember Erin as the beautiful, smart, funny woman that she was, end quote. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, there was no obvious trauma to Erin's body that would suggest her cause of death. She didn't have wounds. She didn't have bruises. It didn't look like there'd been a struggle. It was as if she'd crawled into the backseat of her car, fallen asleep, and never woken up. The police announced that they were investigating, but very early on, they also reported that they had ruled out foul play. An autopsy, which could reveal Aaron's cause of death, whether it be a stroke, heart failure, or a sudden hemorrhage, would not be completed until the following February. Harrison Weinstein also reported that his wife had no diagnosis of a mental health disorder, and even though her behavior had some characteristics of a manic episode, including feelings of euphoria, racing thoughts, and attention problems, Harrison said Aaron had never shown the these symptoms before. When the autopsy results came back, it revealed that Aaron's death had been ruled as being from natural causes and sudden death in the setting of an acute manic episode. But the report provided no further details and didn't elaborate on what had actually killed Aaron. Sally Aiken, a medical examiner and vice president of the National Association of Medical Examiners, described the medical definition of sudden death as an unexpected death that occurs within an hour of onset and has a natural cause. It was also revealed that Erin had previously been diagnosed with a thyroid condition that she was prescribed medication for, and the autopsy report made note of this, stating that her condition could have contributed to her death, but also stating that blood samples had not been satisfactory for analysis as to whether Erin had taken her medication for her thyroid problem or if she'd stopped doing that. A police review of Aaron's communications in the days leading up to her death claimed she'd been showing symptoms of a manic episode, and this suggested that the etymology of her final manic episode was related to an emerging, previously undiagnosed psychiatric disorder. According to the internet, the most common cause of death associated with acute mania is dehydration and hypochloremia, which occurs when there's a low level of chloride in your body. This can be caused by fluid loss through nausea or vomiting or by existing conditions, diseases, or medications. A blood test can be used to confirm hypochloremia, but it has not been revealed whether or not Aaron's blood had been tested for this. And if it was, we did not get the information or what the results were. Basically, the concept would be that the person in a manic state forgets to eat or drink, thus causing their own death unintentionally. But we do know that Aaron had been at dinner Sunday night and at lunch on Monday, so did she not eat or drink that entire time? If that was the case, the gentleman that she met with 
never stated that. That would seem to be weird behavior if you went to dinner and lunch and you didn't eat or drink anything. That would be something that would stand out to your guest, the person you were sharing a meal with. That would be something they might mention in an interview or mention to the police, right? Aaron's toxicology report had come back stating there was no sign of prescription drugs or other substances in her body, but once again, it was not revealed which prescription drugs or substances were tested for. This very vague answer to a seemingly unexplainable tragedy, like basically she had an undiagnosed mental health condition, she she was triggered by it or this was stimulated somehow in her and then she died as a result of it, it did not provide Aaron's loved ones with any closure. And there were still so many questions remaining. How had Aaron's car, with her body in the back seat, sat on a residential road for five days with no one noticing or calling? calling it in, especially because it was reported that volunteers had searched that area in the days before Aaron was found. Many people could also not understand how a person could not exhibit any signs of a mental illness for 33 years of their life and then suddenly die due to a manic episode. Let's first explore the more logical theory that Aaron did in fact appear to be fine throughout most of her life before something triggered a sudden onset of mania leading to her death possibly due to dehydration or hypochloremia or possibly due to a heart attack, even though this has not been confirmed. According to the National Institute for Health, the risk of sudden cardiac death is remarkably high in bipolar disorder patients across their lifespan. Heart.org reports that people with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or schizoaffective disorders may have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease at a younger age than those without a serious mental health condition. The article states, quote, previous research has indicated that people diagnosed with serious mental illness die 10 to to 20 years earlier than the general population, and their leading cause of death is heart disease. Even at younger ages, people with serious mental illness had a higher risk of heart disease than their peers, end quote. Even if Erin had never shown any signs of having manic episodes before, she could have begun showing symptoms for the first time in her life during her time in California in 2019. Bipolar disorder can appear in any gender at any age. It usually starts in your teens or 20s, but often women have their first depressive episode as an adult, and that is often followed by their first manic or hypermanic episode. Episode. This differs from men who often have their first manic episode in childhood. There is also some evidence that women are diagnosed with bipolar disorder later in life than men, and it's not very clear why. It may be because women simply get bipolar disorder later in life than men, or it may be because the disorder goes undiagnosed in women for years. However, looking at the signs of bipolar disorder in women, it doesn't really appear that Aaron fits the bill. These symptoms include feeling sad, hopeless, or irritable most of the time, lacking energy, difficulty concentrating and remembering things, a loss of interest in everyday activities, feelings of emptiness or worthlessness, feelings of guilt and despair, feeling pessimistic about everything, and self-doubt. Bipolar women are also more likely than their male counterparts to have migraines, autoimmune diseases, and hypothyroidism, which brings us to Aaron's thyroid condition, which we don't know whether it was a hypothyroid or a hyperthyroid, but I did find some information about something called a thyrotoxic storm which I had never heard about before and it's super interesting because I guess this happens quite a bit but I had never even known it was a thing before and to find out that people live with this and struggle with this is incredibly sad. I feel terrible for them because it's like not only do some people have to struggle with mental health issues where others don't, but those people are now also faced with the looming possibility that they might have physical health issues due to their mental health issues. And it's just such a, an uphill battle and it's so much harder to live life that way. People who have physical and mental health intact and who don't have to struggle with these things really don't appreciate what other people who do have to struggle with these things go through and how amazing and nice it is to just be able to wake up and not be in a constant crisis every single day. So a thyrotoxic storm is actually an acute life-threatening complication of hyperthyroidism and it comes on with sudden multi-system involvement. During a thyroid storm, a person's heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature can suddenly soar to dangerously high levels and without immediate treatment, a thyroid 
thyroid storm is often fatal. People with hyperthyroidism may develop a thyroid storm after experiencing trauma, severe emotional distress, congestive heart failure, and a pulmonary embolism. Some symptoms of thyroid storms are a racing heart, high fever, persistent sweating, shaking, agitation, restlessness, confusion, and unconsciousness. So maybe Erin began to experience these things, and so she pulled over on her way to the airport and got into the backseat of her car to try and lay down because she wasn't feeling well and she didn't know why. And then she passed away. I suppose that is possible, but once again, we don't know if Erin had hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, and we don't know if she was taking her medication. If she was, there wouldn't be much of a reason for her to get this um, thyroid storm, as far as I know, and she had never experienced that before. So I'm just not sure how possible it is, but it is possible. Now on to the less logical theories. But before we discuss those, we do need to talk about the matrix and what exactly that means, at least when it comes to the series of films that that we hopefully all know and love. And if you don't, you should know them, go watch them, and you will love them, I hope. So according to the story, the events of The Matrix that we see taking place in the first film, those actually are taking place in the year 2199, 100 years after a war between humans and the AI machines that humans created stupidly, might I add. And even though scenes from the movie take place in 1999, we come to find out that these events were not real. They were simply a computer simulated program that was created by these AI machines to enslave the human race. And it is the computer simulation that is known as the Matrix. These AI beings were created by humans in the early 21st century. And at some point, the AI and the humans who created them found themselves having a difference of opinion. And and then they had a falling out of some kind, leading the AI to see humans as a threat to their very existence. So they overpowered the humans and found a way to use them as batteries to start powering these AI machines. It's like Frankenstein's monster all over again. You know, it's like, are humans ever going to learn? Because I think we're in that place where we're using AI for way too much and we're depending on it for way too much and we're not realizing that these AI um, programs are going to start evolving and may become sentient. Like there is a possibility of that. But anyways, what do I know? By the time we get to see the events of the movie, humans are already synthetically being grown and placed inside of pods that exist in this large power plant. And inside these pods, the humans are alive, but they're unconscious and plugged into the matrix, existing in a simulated world that they believe to be real while they're drained of their energy that fuels the AI machines in the real world, which is not a fun place to be, by the way. The real world at this time in this movie. It's dark, it's gritty, and it's scary. And it's patrolled by AI computer programs known as the agents, who are the gatekeepers of the Matrix. Now that brings us to our main protagonist, Neo, who has lived in the Matrix all of his life, but he's always felt unsettled, as if something wasn't quite right. Which apparently most other humans in the Matrix did not experience this um, cognizant feeling that like, I know I'm living my life and I know I'm going through my day and I'm going to work and I'm seeing people, but something feels off. I don't feel like I'm real. I don't feel like this is real. And the reason that Neo felt this way is because he's different, right? His brain on some level rejected the programming of the Matrix. Now, this series of movies has triggered something in people for decades. It's caused them to think about their own lives and how much of their own world is real. According to Vision.org, quote, the movie's core theme examines the idea that people can be blinded to the truth about their existence, unable to know any better. They search, but are unable to see the truth through the illusion that the world before them portrays. As Morpheus tells Neo, you're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You've felt it your entire life, that there is something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. And honestly... This is coming from me, but who among us has not felt that at least once or twice in our lifetimes or every day, if you're me? Every day I'm like, am I real? Are these people real? Is everything around me real? Are these NPCs? Like, why are, are they acting in this way? I don't understand this way that they're acting. 
are, are any of us real? What's happening here? It's a, a very like weird dissociation, um, derealization, depersonalization kind of thing that haunts me, and I hate it. So the article continues, stating, quote, When we attempt to think about the nature of our existence, about why we are here, the myriad complexities of life often stop us before we start. Life is just too complicated. How do we know what is real and what is simply illusion brought on by our subjective view of the world? How can we be objective about the universe we live in when we can understand it only through the five physical senses? Is it possible that we could be blinded about why we exist? Are we, like the people held captive in the Matrix, oblivious to why we are here? Have we been deceived into believing that the physical reality around us is all there really is to life? Or is there something more? Is it possible that humankind really is being held captive? What is the truth? End quote. Now, am I suggesting that Erin Valenti fell asleep in the Matrix and woke up in the real world and she's currently being pursued by the agents? Not necessarily, but life does tend to imitate art, and there are very real scientific theories and technological advances that could alter our reality. I can't go too deep into this theory in this video because we simply just do not have the time, but there's something called ancestor simulations. And this is a theory proposed by Nick Bostrom, a professor at Oxford University. Bostrom believes that with the advancement of human technology and intelligence, it will be possible in the future to simulate the actions of all the neurons in the brain, thereby simulating the sensory input to the brain with enough accuracy to convince the simulation that he or she is a real person living a real life. Bostrom has claimed that based on his calculations, a super advanced civilization could do this on such a large scale that the virtual minds would far outnumber the real minds. And you might say that, yeah, this is plausible in the far, 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 far away future. But what you need to understand is that it may already be the far, 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 far away future. And we could be living in these simulations thinking it's 2023, like Neo thought it was 1999, when in reality, outside of the simulation, outside of the matrix, it isn't. And an advanced civilization already exists, trapping us in the past. And you might also ask, well, what would be their motive to do this? I mean, there could be a lot of reasons why an advanced civilization would do this. They might do this for reasons that we ourselves look into the past by digging up bones and studying ancient manuscripts to understand our own history, to study the behavior, the lives, and the thought processes of those who came before us. They could also be doing it to have some, you know, like simulation game, like we play The Sims. Are The Sims real? Do The Sims think they're real? Are we The Sims? And some advanced civilization is just having a lot of fun with us right now, seeing what we're going to do when they put us in stupid circumstances, seeing what choice we're going to make when we're faced with a very difficult decision, when we're faced with a fork in the road. I don't know. Rizwan Verk, a computer scientist and video game designer who wrote the 2019 book The Simulation Hypothesis, believes in this theory, saying, quote, I think there's a very good chance we are, in fact, living in a simulation, though we can't say that with 100 percent confidence, end quote. And what can we say with 100 percent confidence at the end of the day? Well, Verk laid out 10 stages of technological development that a civilization would have to go through in order to get to the simulation point, which is the point that a hyper-realistic simulation could be created. He claims that we are currently at stage five, with stage six being humans figuring out how to render something like virtual reality without having to put on glasses or a headset. So basically, we're at a stage where we can put on VR goggles and trick our brains at times into thinking we're actually in this VR world. And I say that from personal experience because I love VR. And um, I once was playing a VR game called Super Hot. And you have to basically like shoot these figures coming at you. And then, you know, once they come at you and you have normal bullets, you got to just like figure it out. And my bullets were out. This one figure that was left, I'd taken everyone else out. The one guy who was left comes charging at me. And in my head, I said, well, there's no way out of this. I don't have bullets. So I'm going to have to get low and bum rush him, get him at the waist, take him off balance and throw him back behind me so I can get away. That's the only thing I can do. So I tossed my gun aside. I got 
got low, waited for him to get close enough where he wouldn't anticipate it, and then I charged him, bum rushed him, got him at his right at his midsection. Well, actually, I didn't because that's not part of the game. He was not a real person, and I charged headfirst into my bedroom window. So you can trick your brain or your brain can trick you into thinking you're actually in these situations that are virtual reality. Now, what Rivon Verk is saying is stage six, the next stage is we'll be able to create these virtual realities, but we won't have to put on a VR headset. So it would reach like Ready Player One levels, right? Also a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Here is Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining why he also believes that this theory is very possible. Here's the argument. Ready? Go ahead. Our computing power is growing rapidly. Right. We create simulations of worlds. We have video games with characters that are inside the video game. Right. Imagine a day where you can simulate a world so perfectly with life forms, humans, so well mm -hmm. that you can recreate every single neurosynaptic thought you could have, but now you're in the simulation on the computer. So, including the perception of free will. Well, there you have it. Because then, so now you would have enough computing power to imbue the Sims inside of the program with all of the human traits that we possess now. Correct. Not only our human traits, Not but only, the world. But the world. The world itself. Right. And you don't have to have all the world existing there at all times, right. that might be an unrealistic amount of computing power. Right. You just need- Enough the, of the world that they see around them. That they see around them. Right. So you want to start digging, and, oh, that's so funny. and haven't put the earth there, there's, there's a flag that goes up in the programmer, and they say, up, oh, need more earth. And so, right. so they put earth beneath you while you can keep digging. It's like the Truman Show. Yeah, well, for example. For, right. Okay, okay. Cool. Or then Minecraft, you can build or stuff. Or Minecraft. Minecraft, right. Oh, that is Minecraft. Right, right, okay. God, that guy's a brilliant genius. Okay. So, and we went to the moon. It's okay, let's make sure what, the moon is what, there. Right. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's why we can't travel faster than the speed of light, because if we could, we'd be able to get to another galaxy before they could before program, they could program oh! that galaxy. Oh! 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 <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Oh. oh, so the programmer put in that limit. Put in the limit. Because that's Speed the fastest they can that's get. A, we can't, we can't oh. program fast oh. enough. Oh. So we put in a limiter. The speed of light is a limiter so that you can't get to the next thing before we build it. All right, so let me finish. That's good. Go that's ahead. good, Chuck. All right. So let me finish this. So now, so now that world evolves and they develop computing power. Right. And they say, we want to play video games. So now we're going to make a world. So then they make a world. And they have sufficient computing power that they invent right. to create a whole universe within their computers. Okay. And then they, they make a it. world. And then they make a world all the way on down. Right. It could be hundreds, thousands, billions, infinite. All right. So, so far, this sounds like it still uh, works. That's fine. So now, close your eyes, throw a dart. Mm. Which of these universes are you going to land in? The first one that's real or the gazillion that are not. Well, yeah. Just statistically, am okay? I, am I drinking when we're playing the starts game? <laughs> okay. Because Because then you miss the entire yeah, everything. No. So, so yeah, there's no, something, you're, there's yeah. something called Bayesian statistics where uh -huh. you're allowed to introduce information that you already have available to you even if you didn't measure it to be true. All so right. we establish the likelihood that one day we'll have the power to do this. Right. And then that factors into these statistics. Okay. So there's one in a zillion, you're the real universe, and 999 zillion to one that That's you, your simulation. Your simulation. Uh, that convinced me. And, and I don't want to be convinced. I didn't like it. And I was just begging for somebody to, to give me an argument that was cogent enough to undermine that entire reasoning. And I suppose that that kind of technology, like ancestor simulations and stuff, that would just so happen to fall under something called bleeding edge technology, a concept that Erin Valenti herself was very interested in. Bleeding edge technology describes a product or service that is ahead of its time and potentially game changing. It's generally defined as newer, more extreme, and more risky than technologies that are on the cutting or leading edge. Aaron Valenti often talked and theorized about bleeding edge technology such as drug-free, implant-free, mind-controlling, brainwave interfacing technology. And her company website actually linked to a place called CTRL Labs, which is neuroscientist Thomas Reardon's Neuroscience and Behavior Center. Okay, so I thought the name Thomas Reardon sounded familiar to me, and I only looked into him as far as his 
part in CTRL Labs. But when I was saying his name, I said, oh, that, that sounds familiar to me. Did he like have a hand in creating Google or Yahoo or something like that? And it turns out, yeah, something like that. So Thomas Reardon was formerly a computer programmer and developer at Microsoft, and he's credited with creating the project to build Microsoft's web browser, Internet Explorer, which was the most used browser during its peak in the early 2000s. He founded CTRL Labs in 2015 with neuroscientists from Columbia University. Following the acquisition of CTRL Labs, he leads the Neural Interfaces Group at Facebook Reality Labs. <laughs> okay, that's interesting, right? I mean, I knew that Thomas Reardon had something to do with Facebook because what we're going to find out is when CTR Labs was founded in 2015, they were developing a wristband that could translate neuromuscular signals into machine interpretable commands. So if you wanted to scroll through your computer without touching your mouse, you could just do that, I guess. <laughs> Which, I mean, how lazy are we getting at this point? But anyways, CTR Labs was acquired by Facebook in September of 2019. And Bloomberg reports that the deal was worth somewhere between $500 million and $1 billion, making it the most substantial acquisition Facebook has made since it paid $2 billion to acquire VR company Oculus in 2014. And anything Facebook does, I don't really trust, Okay. Just just saying, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, I don't trust these people at all. And it's interesting that Facebook would acquire Oculus technology in 2014, which is the VR headset. And then in 2015, they would acquire CTRL Labs for this neuromuscular sort of wristband or technology in general, right? Because it doesn't have to be a wristband. It can just be the technology that they use for other wearable devices that allow you to control computers and things without touching them. At Web Summit 2019, Thomas Reardon actually spoke to VentureBeat.com about his neural interface tech, and he gave some insight into why Facebook and the tech world in general were so interested in it. VentureBeat.com writes, quote, in short, CTRL Labs wants us to interact with technology, not via a mouse, a keyboard, a touchscreen, our voice, or any other input we've adopted. Reardon and his team expect that in a few years we will be able to use individual neurons, not thoughts, to directly control technology, end quote. So it's not just like, oh, my neuromuscular things are being picked up on. It's like I want to be able to control things with my mind, right? I want to be able to look at my computer and think to myself, open up my Google Drive, and then it does that. And then I want to be able to think to myself, all right, let's type this. One day, Mary was walking through the forest when she came upon a little lamb. And then it'll do that without you having to touch anything or even to speak out loud. So essentially, this technology would be able to read your mind. And I don't know if this is obvious or not. But it isn't a far leap from mind reading to mind control. In fact, according to a 2020 article in Scientific American, mind reading technology is right around the corner. And as we'll come to find out, we are at that corner now. So maybe Scientific American in 2020 thought that it was right around the corner, but we are pretty much there now. And actually, the person who was writing the article, they said that they believe humans need to figure out the ethical implications of that before that time arrives, right? I agree. That is something that I don't think enough people keep in mind when they're pushing forward with all this progress and technology. And it's always good to ask yourself the question, just because I can, does it mean that I should? We're already at a point where scientists have proven in experimental research that they can use fMRI brain imaging to decipher what a person is thinking and feeling. Neuroscientist Marcel Just and his team at Carnegie Mellon University have used fMRI machines to analyze complex patterns of activity in a person's brain when they think of a specific number or object, read a sentence, experience a particular emotion, or learn a new type of information. And then I found a May 2023 Guardian article titled, AI makes non-invasive mind reading possible by turning thoughts into text. <laughs> this article tells us that an AI-based decoder is now capable of translating brain activity into a continuous stream of text, which, quote, 
allows a person's thoughts to be read non-invasively for the first time, end quote, which is ironic because uh, they said non-invasively. And what they mean is you don't have to be strapped up to an fMRI machine. You can't lug a big machine around with your head in it. They have found a way to do this much more portably, as in you could always have this thing on you. But I thought it was funny because it's like, oh, it allows us to read a person's thoughts non-invasively when I cannot imagine anything more invasive than reading a person's thoughts. And I don't really like that. It makes me very uncomfortable. As with everything else that has been forced upon us claiming to offer benefits in medicine and health, this seems benign at first glance. But is it? The only thing we have these days that is truly private are our thoughts. That's it. I mean, our phones and our computers and our social media platforms know about everything that we look up, know about everything that we're interested in. It's hearing us talk to other people in our own homes and in our own private lives about things we're interested in. And then it gives us what we want, right? That's the algorithm. And sometimes we think this is very convenient, that this algorithm has picked up on my interests and what I want to see so that I don't have to see other stuff. But isn't it weird? Isn't it kind of weird? The only thing that we have that are truly private are our private thoughts that we do not speak out loud, that we do not talk to anybody about, that we don't even write down. And what if you could be forced into one of these neural devices so that your personal thoughts could be translated into text? What are the implications of that? It's Minority Report. It's every terrifying sci-fi movie you've ever watched and said, phew, glad that's not real. And I know that Minority Report is an older movie. Maybe some of you haven't seen it. Once again, you should watch it. Tom Cruise is in it. It's a really good movie. Um, It was one of my favorite movies. Like, I remember it was one of the few DVDs I brought with me when I went to college. Like, DVDs, that's that's where I was. I brought Minority Report. I brought um, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. I brought Zoolander. And I think it's called The Sweetest Thing. It's got Cameron Diaz in it. Um, but basically I had a little bit of everything, you know, a little bit of everything, some comedy, some romantic comedy, some scary, creepy sci-fi movie. And that's where Minority Report falls in. It's a scary, creepy sci-fi movie. It takes place in the year 2054 when the federal government have implemented a program called the Pre-Crime Police Program. The pre-crime police program. In this movie, the police use three humans with clairvoyant abilities that they call precogs to get psychic impressions of future crimes. And then based on this information, people get arrested and thrown behind bars for crimes they had not even committed yet. Or they get executed for crimes they had not even committed yet. So in this scenario, it wouldn't be these humans who have, you know, psychic powers. It would be this AI which, you know, AI that has psychic powers. In the wrong hands, mind-reading technology could be used to not only invade your privacy, which is bad enough, but it could be used to manipulate people. It could be used for government surveillance or in police interrogations where our constitutional rights against self-incrimination would no longer matter if authorities can just drop in on your thoughts whenever they want to. Nita Farhani, author of The Battle for Your Brain, said, quote, This research shows how rapidly generative AI is enabling even our thoughts to be read. Before neurotechnology is used at scale in society, we need to protect humanity with a right to self-determination over our brain and mental experiences, end quote. And The Battle for Your Brain is a great book. You should read it if you haven't already. Um, she's, she's right. She's absolutely right. Just because we can doesn't mean that we should. Imagine the implications. Imagine how bad this could be. Not just if you were a bad person, right? But if you were a good person that somebody else thought was bad. Or if you were a good person speaking out against a greater power that was bad. And that greater power wanted you silenced. A team at the University of Texas at Austin illustrates a technique that was developed to translate people's brain activity into actual speech. And a study was done to examine the implications of this new tech. And this is basically for people, let's say they've had a stroke or they have some sort of um, disability where they cannot speak. So it would just allow them to be able to speak with a sort of like machine, right? Like they could think things and then it would come out. So they once again will pose this as like, look at these great benefits for medicine, for the medical field. But then they would have to ask themselves, what else could this be used for? So this study was done basically to examine like, what are these scientists doing? 
Is it bad? Is it good? Could it in the future become bad? And the authors of this study have basically said, don't worry, right? Because currently, cooperation is required to both train and apply the decoder. But see how they said currently? They'll tell you what they're up to if you listen. And I don't need some brain decoder technology to know what that one little word currently means. That means currently. It means that could change in the future. It means it's currently now, but maybe in the future, the participants don't need to give their permission, right? And the study goes on to say, quote, however, future developments might enable decoders to bypass these requirements. Moreover, even if decoder predictions are inaccurate without subject cooperation, they could be intentionally misinterpreted for malicious purposes, end quote which I appreciate the study at least being honest about that because imagine how technology like this might be used against one's political opponents depending on who is in power at any given moment. If you want to throw every single person who poses a threat to your control into prison, you could just say that you brought them in for an interview, you read their mind, and found that they were forming some nefarious plot inside of it, even if that wasn't true at all. Because as we've seen throughout history, scientists and the medical field will often fall in line with the government agenda, especially when most of their funding comes from that government or especially when they're being threatened to produce results that support the current narrative. Nazi Germany is an example of this, and I'm sure you can find many more examples of this throughout history, even in our current times. If you really think about it, six months ago, a technology was introduced at the World Economic Forum that allows employers to monitor the brainwaves of their employees. I shit you not. I'm serious about this. Here, listen to her talk about it. Uh, it's going to make you see the future and understand a wonderful future where we can use brainwaves to fight crime, be more productive and find love. Let's roll. Sensing your joy, your playlist shifts to your favorite song. Sending chills up your spine as the music begins to play. You glance at the program running in the background on your computer screen and notice a now familiar sight that appears whenever you're overloaded with pleasure. Your theta brainwave activity decreasing in the temporal regions of your brain. You mentally move the cursor to the left and scroll through your brain data over the past few hours. You can see your stress levels rising as the deadline to finish your memo approached, causing a peak in your beta brainwave activity right before an alert popped up, telling you to take a brain break. Your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team, whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about, given the policy against intra-office romance. But you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. You breathe a sigh of relief when the email she sends you later that day congratulates you on your brain metrics from the past quarter, which have earned you another performance bonus. When you arrive at work the next day, a somber cloud has fallen over the office. Along with emails, text messages, and GPS location data, the government has subpoenaed employees' brainwave data from the past year. They have compelling evidence that one of your coworkers has committed massive wire fraud. Now, they're looking for his co-conspirators. You discover they are looking for synchronized brain activity between your coworker and the people he has been working with. While you know you're innocent of any crime, you've been secretly working with him on a new startup venture. Shaking you remove your earbuds. What do you think? Is it a future you're ready for? You may be surprised to learn that it's a future that has already arrived. Everything in that video that you just saw is based on technology that is already here today. Artificial intelligence has enabled advances in decoding brain activity in ways that we never before thought possible. After all, what you think, what you feel, it's all just data. Data that in large patterns can be decoded using artificial intelligence. We're not talking about implanted devices of the future. I'm talking about wearable devices that are like Fitbits for your brain. The newest way to monitor attention is through a device like this one. These are ear pods that are launching later this year. These ear pods, much like the video you watched earlier, are ear pods that can pick up brainwave activity and tell whether or not a person is paying attention 
or their mind is wandering. Okay, well, you might think, fine, but even if we can tell whether a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering, you can't tell what they're paying attention to. You would be wrong. It turns out that you can not only tell whether, whether a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering, but you can discriminate between the kinds of things that they're paying attention to. Whether they're doing something like central tasks, like programming, peripheral tasks, like writing documentation, or unrelated tasks, like surfing social media or online browsing. When you combine brainwave activity together with other forms of software and surveillance technology, the power becomes quite precise. So what do we do with this? What do we do with technology that enables us to monitor brainwave activity for attention? Do we embrace it? Do we resist it? I believe that there is a pathway forward with such technology. We might soon even use the technology to help people wake back up. This is a haptic scarf that MIT Media Lab has developed, which uses brainwave technology in a responsive way to give a person a little buzz, <laughs> literally when their mind starts to wander to help them refocus and hone their attention. I'm giving you the positive use cases because what I don't want the reaction to be is let's ban this. I mean, these people are completely out of their mind if they think that this would make anyone's life better. <laughs> they are out of their minds. All it would do is make us more pliable, more controllable, and more known to those who may not always have the best intentions for us. I mean, did you hear what that woman said? What you think, what you feel, it's all just data to be decoded using artificial intelligence. These people who are in high positions of power throughout the world, they think that your feelings, your emotions, your experiences, your memories, it's all just data to be decoded using AI. That's how they view you. So keep in mind that the people who want to use this technology to basically eliminate any private or personal thought you might have, they don't want to do it to make your life better. They want to do it to make their life better and to make them more able to get you to do what they want you to do. Now, how does all of this relate to Erin Valenti? Well, there are some theories out there that wonder if the three-day seminar she attended before her death affected her in some way. It was very intense. We kind of already figured that out. Could Erin have been triggered by the excitement and stimulation of this very intense program, bringing on the onset of a previously undiagnosed mental illness? Or could Erin's thoughts and behaviors been affected by the very thing that she was interested in exploring? Brain machine interfaces, mind reading devices, mind controlling devices. Could the people behind the Create Powerful Retreat have access to these things? They are, after all, very involved with many people like Erin herself, entrepreneurs of all kinds. They are, you know, very in touch with Silicon Valley, with the tech community, including those in the field of cutting edge and bleeding edge tech. And based on the testimonials of this course being life changing, right? Allowing someone to be awake for the first time in their life, seeing people transform in front of you, it does seem like something has to be happening in order to create such dramatic results and such a passionate following. Obviously, this is all just speculation and wild speculation at that because it's Halloween. But you do have to wonder, a healthy, active 33-year-old woman who had never shown signs of manic episodes or mental health issues before flies to California to participate in an intensive and immersive seminar that is designed to change your life and completely change the way you think. Erin seemed very impacted by what she had learned and what she had experienced. She told her friends and family she couldn't wait to get back so she could start implementing some of these techniques into her own life to make her own life better. Erin met with two different people the night before and the day of her incident, and neither of these people have mentioned that she was acting differently. But as soon as she left her lunch, Erin began acting strangely on the phone with her family, almost as if she'd been activated. She couldn't find her car. She was talking about the Matrix. She's driving around aimlessly. She says she needs gas, but she also says she just got gas. She says her GPS isn't working, but the GPS would have never been working in that car because it wasn't activated. Did she mean the GPS on her phone? I don't know. She wasn't far from the airport, which was her destination, but she never went to the airport. And then after being missing for five days, Erin was found in the backseat of her car on a residential street just a few blocks away from where her phone had last pinged. And we're expected to believe... She was there in her car the entire five days. No one who lived on that street noticed her car or called the police about this random car parked on their street for almost a week or took a peek inside the car and alerted the authorities when they saw a lifeless body laying in the back seat. 
There were 1,500 people out there looking for Erin in the days after her disappearance, and they'd been looking in that area since it was the general vicinity of her last known location, but no one spotted her or her car for five days? Now, that might suggest the car hadn't been parked on Boys Lane during the entire time Erin was missing, and if that's the case, where was she? Who was she with? And why had she completely discarded her earlier plans to go to this place with this person? Or did she go somewhere and then park on that street later? But if that's the case, it wouldn't be an acute manic episode because remember, death from an acute manic episode is going to happen within an hour of that manic episode starting. Aaron Valenti's death certainly leaves us with more questions than answers. But in the wise words of Morpheus, I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. So I invite you to do some more research into the Erin Valenti case. I invite you to look more into this brain reading technology, this brain mapping technology, this technology that's going to allow people to have your very private thoughts translated into text. I invite you to explore these topics that may make you feel uncomfortable but may also become your reality sooner than later. Before we wrap up, I do want to do Stephanie's Small Business Showcase Halloween version. And it just so happens that I am wearing these adorable alien earrings from the business we're talking about today. These were actually sent to me in my P.O. box along with a bunch of other cute ones, some butterflies, some little navy blue alien dudes, such cute earrings, amazing, and they came from Faber Manor. Faber Manor has a variety of earrings, long beaded ones, kind of these alien ones like I have. They have a cottage core collection, an emerald summer collection, which I love the emerald summer collection because I don't know if you know but my favorite color is green. These are beautiful. I love different funky earrings, different like jewelry, something that you wouldn't just be able to walk into a store and buy. I love them for myself. I love to give them as gifts. And Faber Manor has everything you could want and more. And the owner of Faber Manor, Nita, she told me that she's coming out with an alien collection for Halloween. She's hoping to be done with them in the next week. I'm recording this in mid-September before I leave for CrimeCon, so she's probably already done with them, so you can check those out too. I'm going to post in the description box Faber Manor's Instagram as well as their website. And and you should check Nita out. Check out her earrings. They are amazing. I really love these. I think they look so, so good. Honestly, my new pair of favorite earrings. And I did not think I would love them as much as I do because I probably wouldn't have bought these on my own. But when I got them and I had them in my hands, I was like, oh, these are the perfect size. They're not too big. They are not heavy at all. I hate sometimes when big earrings are heavy and they pull down my ears and they look weird. They're not heavy at all. They're so cute. They're such a statement piece. I love them. So go check out Faber Manor. All links are in the description box. And I thank you so so much for joining me for this first video of Halloween 2023. Thank you so much for being here. Like the video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. And stay tuned for a month of Halloween content. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Stay spooky. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voice is getting too loud Oh, these feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say your hell Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly It's all you got To let it go I got blood, blood on the strings, blood, blood on the strings, blood, blood on the strings. Been blood from my face, don't be. I got blood, blood on the strings, blood, blood on the strings, blood, blood on the strings. God knows, been a rough week. Yeah, I'm channeling my son house.